The purpose of this talk is to give an overview of the Life Raft Group Research Group, which is funded by all of you. Um, so as Norman said, I'm user friendly. If something I say doesn't make sense or you have a question or you just want to interrupt and make a comment, feel free. Uh, if I don't see you, you know, bark or squeak or something and, and, and I'll pay attention to you and, and um, uh, we'll get to your question. <clears throat> There's going to be several opportunities to, to talk to the researchers this morning as well. So beyond this presentation, we're going to have a ask the doc question a little bit later. And so, um, and Mike Heinrich will, will join me for that. Um, okay. <clears throat> Got a little bit of a cold, so if I'd be chucked from drinking water in this presentation, uh, that's why. Uh, okay. So let's get going. So um, for those of you who don't know, and I, I know, look out and I see so many friendly faces and people that I remember from various life fests and other uh, gatherings. Um, but some of you I don't recognize, and so just to get everybody on the same page, um, the first slide is about the Life Rift Group uh, Research Group. And so we're an international collaboration between what I like to call the best and the brightest uh, GIST researchers in the USA and Europe. And this group was specifically selected because we all get along with each other and we want to collaborate. And so the idea was to foster collaboration and teamwork, which is a bit unusual in science. A lot of scientists tend to uh, like to hang out by themselves and not share their work and so forth. So this group is all about sharing and teamwork. Um, we're also able to take advantage of the LRG database that's being assembled by Jerry Call and Matt Vanderine, who's a member of our group, um, which consists of patient data. All of your tumors that you've submitted We've taken samples and we're able to use those along with the excellent clinical histories that uh, Jerry has amassed. So that's a very powerful tool uh, that we're now really starting to use uh, more than we have before. And I do want to emphasize that we are your research team. We feel very grateful to be funded by the Life Raft Group and so we are at your disposal. Um, if you ever have questions about research or whatever, I'm sure that uh, I can speak for myself and say I'd be happy to be contacted by anybody in the room, but I know that the others feel the same way. So if you ever have questions you want direct access to the front lines of GIST research, uh, feel free to give us uh, an email. It's the best way to contact us and we're all good about returning those. Uh, this is a picture of the Life Raft Group research group with a few regular uh, Life Raft Group members as well, just to introduce the, the players. This is Matt Vanderein. He's at Stanford University. Uh, Annette Duenson. University of Pittsburgh, and you'll meet them throughout this presentation as well. This is Maria W. Richter, who's in Live in Belgium. Mike Heinrich, you know, uh, you got received an award last night, and you'll be speaking right after me. Um, here's Chris Corliss, who's also at Oregon Health Sciences. These two are kind of a team. They do a lot of team activities, and uh, probably many of you just have met them or know about them through being engaged in clinical trials, because they essentially review all of the molecular data for all the clinical trials performed in North America pertaining to GIST. Uh, this is Jonathan Fletcher, um, and uh, this is Enrique from Jonathan's lab. He's a postdoc who sort of, um, as he's matured, um, has sort of become an ad hoc member of the group, if you will. And I don't think I forgot any more of the research group there. Um, and this was, picture was taken at a meeting we had in Belgium last year that was hosted by Maria, we get together once a year to discuss data at, in a really intensive, all-day manner. We also have meetings about four times a year uh, where we um, do it over the web, and it's a web-based sharing of data and, and making plans and so forth. So uh, just administratively, we really um, function under two grant uh, types of grants. There's a core grant that um, we receive each year, and that really pushes projects that are more about infrastructure and developing it an overall framework to do GIST research. I think the easiest thing to mention is um, like mouse models. I make mouse models of GIST, so little mice that all develop GIST, and we can use those for many clinical trials uh, and so forth. And then this DJ project, which was really spurred by uh, the very large amount of money that was raised by the Dutch Life Raft uh, group, um, is essentially, as its name implies, it's an all-out assault on GIST. And, um, this, this really is a very comprehensive, long-ranging, long-term research program which we think will really accelerate the pace of research, and it already has. And the project, of course, was named after the mission to storm the beaches of Normandy in 1944. So um, it's a war on just that um, we're participating in at the research level, if you will. 
Uh, so the D-Day project really consists of three projects, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And, and really what I'm going to provide you with is snippets of what's going on. We're not going to get into anything in detail. Um, I will intentionally be a bit vague about some of the details because I think um, a very detailed discussion of this work would require many hours, uh, days, in, in fact, to discuss all the details. So if there's something that you want to know that I don't mention, by all means speak up and I'd be happy to provide you with that information. So. There's three, three main projects. The first project is next generation sequencing, and I will talk about all these projects a little bit in specific. The first is a functional, or the second is a functional screening project, and then there's a drug screening project. And so these three big projects, we integrate them uh, under the principle of target identification. And I hope that what I mean by that will become clear during my talk. Basically, if we identify something here, here, and here, we know it's going to be important. We integrate that data that's generated by each of these uh, methodologies, essentially, and try to um, basically hit a home run with our research. Uh, and then a critical aspect of this work, I mean, these look like major, major projects, and they are, but I would argue that this is really the largest amount of work, is once we identify a target, we have to validate that target before we bring it into the clinical arena. I mean, our goal is to translate any finding into a, into a therapy, which is either going to prolong life or cure patients with GIST. And so we want to make sure that we get the biggest hits, the best winners, before we proceed on. And that, that, that requires validation of these hits. And that's a really painstaking uh, process that takes quite a bit of time. So the first project that we're going to talk about is sequencing the GIST uh, genome. Um, you'll hear next generation sequencing is kind of a buzzword for this area. And essentially this is the technology that was enabled by the, uh, all of the technology that was developed to do the, the, the sequence, the human genome. And this company, Illumina, sprung up basically based on that, um, all that technology. They developed the machines which enable this amazing technology. And um, so this is actually spearheaded by Mike and Chris. Um, in, in Oregon, and uh, they've taken samples now from Portland, Boston, Pittsburgh, Livin, and Essen. So you can see we're using the GIST research group already to donate samples. And the reason that all these different centers have put in samples is we've very carefully selected our samples to represent different types of GISTs, uh, different types of GIST um, that are resistant to Gleevec, Sutent, and so forth. And um, so we've so far, I'm not sure if this is totally up to date. It's a moving number, and literally they are uh, analyzing samples each week. But as of the making of this slide, there were 38 samples um, that were in process um, and being analyzed from 23 uh, unique patients. And they really span the different mutations that we see in GIST. Um, and some of the samples um, are still awaiting analysis, but the first group's going to be um, about 46 um, patients, which is quite a bit. Uh, that's really a huge uh, amount of data. Um, and the results will be correlated with Jonathan Fletcher from his genome-wide shRNA eye screening, which I'll tell you about in uh, a moment. So um, Mike yesterday at the board meeting said that um, people don't realize how much data a single sequencing run uh, generates. So for those of you who are a bit tech savvy, uh, one tumor that sequenced generates uh, on the order of two terabytes of data. And that's a huge amount of data. Basically, it gets delivered on a hard drive or uploaded to the cloud. And uh, then the real work begins, the bioinformatic analysis, because gene sequences by themselves don't really tell you much. But um, the, the idea is to figure out what all these genes are doing and uh, eventually to drug the processes that are essentially activated or inactivated. And so this pie chart here, and I'm, obviously I can't get into all the data, is um, a breakdown, a sort of an ontologic breakdown of all the different mutations that, that have been found so far. So this is from 25 space specimens from 18 patients plus four GIST cell lines, the four kind of workhorse cell lines that we all use, and 214 unique genes were identified that were mutated across all these GIST samples. And here's the breakdown. So for instance, uh, some of them were in tumor suppressor genes, which um, are known to sort of suppress cancer. And so when those are mutated, they activate cancer, if you will. Um, 
ones involved in translation and transcription, those are very basic processes which cause proteins to be made, genes to be um, turned into proteins, et cetera. And we're not going to go into all this detail, but just to kind of impress to you the complexity. And one of the things I really like about this project is we're building a database that we're going to be able to access over and over and over again. So as the technologies improve and we're able to um, take advantage of bioinformatics um, progress, we'll be able to reanalyze the data and make even better sense of it. So this is just kind of a hit list of um, what was on that pie chart. And I'm particularly fond of this area, apoptosis or autophagy, have to do with how cells survive different kinds of therapy and stresses. And I particularly think if we can take advantage of this, figure out how to inactivate those pathways or uh, inactivate autophagy but activate a apoptosis, that could be a real winner um, for GIST therapy. But then this is just the rest of the list and, and it's quite comprehensive. So literally every process which happens in a cell is mutated within GIST samples. And our goal is to find out the common themes in these GIST samples and address them clinically. So um, this is just kind of an example of the TP53 gene. So TP53 is a tumor suppressor. It's actually involved in a variety of cancers. In fact, there's groups of patients which have, who have germline mutations in TP53. And of course, what, what happens with them is they develop various kinds of cancers. And so um, looking across here, this is a bunch of GIST samples that, that, was, uh, that were sequenced by Mike and Chris. And where there's a blue mark, that means that there was a P53 mutation. And so you can see there were three P53 mutations in this group of samples. But P53 doesn't act on its own. It acts in a pathway, which includes these other genes, which have kind of funny names, and I won't go into that. But um, so this would be pathway analysis. So we found a mutation here, and now we're looking within the pathway. And you can see amplification here. This is actually a, excuse me, a negative regulator of P53. And then there's mutations in these genes as well in this sample. And so this pathway seems to be quite effective within GIST. And um, that's one of the findings that we've already had from this deep sequencing research. Now, over here, I'm going to tell you a bit about this a, a little bit later, but this is the process of integration. So another screen that's being done in Jonathan Fletcher's lab also looks um, at whether these genes affect the biology, essentially, of GIST cells. <coughs> and when you see these red marks here, that means that they're good hits. Red, red is a hit in the right direction for P53. Green is a hit in the right direction for MDM2. And of course, these were big hits in these two different cell lines. And so this is what I mean by integrating. So we found something by deep sequencing. It's also been found by SHRNA screen. That's powerful data already. And we know that P53, at least in a subset of GIS, is going to play a very important role in their biology. And so um, that's the kind of de data that we're generating. And uh, you know, honestly, P53 was probably one of the lowest hanging fruit in this huge amount of data that we've collected. But it really validates the whole process of what we're doing. And our, our real goal is to find things that we don't know about or haven't really suspected that are involved that really will be targetable. And those will be the real home runs and grand slams that will enable this um, GIST therapy to move forward um, in a big way. So just the sequencing summary is, um, uh, we didn't talk about P16, but he's a, it's similar to P53. It's a tumor suppressor. So P16 and P53 have been identified um, in GIST. He, he also found a PIK3CA uh, mutation, which is kind of important because it's in the PI3K pathway. That's a pathway that we know is downstream of KIT, and again, it validates this whole process. Um, and I'm um, not going to talk about it today, but Mike's found some novel kinase mutations that are also um, found in these GIST samples. And anytime you see the word kinase, associated with mutation, that's a good thing for the GIST community because we can drug kinases. KID is a kinase, and the reason that KID's been such an attractive and excellent therapeutic target is we can drug it. We know how to drug kinases. And so anytime we see a kinase with a mutation, we'll focus on that as a research group, learn about it, learn whether um, that it, 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 it adversely affects the behavior when it's drugged. Um, uh, and then, just to, uh, to also uh, maybe conclude the, the sequencing portion, so um, w 
we worked it so far in about 40 samples with um, dredging, really, the whole genome for sequences. But now the goal is to validate that. So I mentioned that validating is a sort of long and painstaking process. And so what validation um, happens in, um, uh, from sequencing is we'll gather a bunch, a large group of patient samples now, and we'll ask whether the mutations that we found uh, in deep sequencing are present in these samples, and that's a much more targeted approach. So we only use a certain number of genes, and we can do that more rapidly than deep sequencing. It's a bit cheaper as well. And um, the goal is to really look at 100 to 200 gists, and in fact, we're going to be including the LRG patient samples from the database, from all of your samples that have been donated. So we're actually going to be analyzing your DNA. I hope that doesn't unnerve anybody, but um, that's exactly what's going to happen. And um, so we're sort of using, again, the LifeRaft group samples to do this research. Uh, we're also using some of our own samples, but really to get a diverse group of samples to validate what we found here at the deep sequencing level. Um, so my, Maria is not really working on this same project in the sense that she's not doing the deep sequencing with Mike and Chris, but I wanted to bring up um, different people's work in the context. So again, there's just too much to cover in 45 minutes, but just to uh, briefly talk about Maria, here she is. This is Maria's frog, and we were all given frogs by Yeroon um, when Yeroon was alive and um, uh, getting to know us as a research group uh, that he was funding. He had found comfort. A friend of his had given him this beautiful uh, it's a gorgeous jewelry sort of quality frog, um, and he would take these frogs to the hospital with him each time he went for a different procedure or something, and uh, I don't have to tell many of you that these are very trying things, and he found comfort in having these frogs, and he started off with a very teeny little frog, and then when he went in again, his friend gave him a bigger frog, and then he finally gave him this sort of giant frog, and then Yeroon gave us all these frogs, so we're wearing our frogs or showing our frogs in our pictures um, to, in the spirit of, of, of Yeroon. So um, Maria did a study that's kind of interesting called the SINSARC GIST study. And what SINSARC is, is, is it's a molecular signature. It's a signature of gene expression. And the French sarcoma group actually made the SINSARC um, gene signature. And what they did was they looked at lots and lots of different sarcomas, and they figured out the gene expression patterns that predicted a bad prognosis, a, a prognosis of metastasis, a prognosis of recurrences. And so Maria applied that signature to GIST. And the reason that this is important, and again, I feel like I don't even have to emphasize these points with you, but I will try to make it very clear why this is an important study, is that with adjuvant Gleevec now, it's become very, very important to absolutely and critically identify those patients who are going to recur or metastasize. Not everybody with a GIST does poorly. About half of GIST patients will not have metastasis, not have recurrences. Uh, their tumors are essentially benign and have no risk for aggressive behavior. So the goal of this study is to identify those risks or, or those GISTs that need therapy, need adjuvant therapy, or at least that we can present it to them. I'm not saying everybody need, has to take adjuvant therapy, but we want to at least present that option to every patient. And so just to show you kind of the result of this study, so this green line here are those patients that did well. And uh, basically this is a recurrence-free survival on this axis. This is time on this axis. And so every time somebody recurs or metastasizes, it, it, it goes down. It's like a little step down, down this ladder. And so you can see that there's a big, big separation between those that were predicted to do well by SINSARC and those that were predicted to do poorly. And so it may be that in the future we'll be applying this genetic signature or a modification of it to patient samples to predict prognosis because currently we don't use these criteria and this appears to be marginally a bit better. And so it would be improvement in our ability to prognosticate how patients, individual patients with GISTs are going to do. Let's talk a little bit about functional screens now. Uh, these are just some pictures of some liquid handling robots that we use when we screen um, in, in different ways using shRNAs and siRNAs and so forth. Um, and I just wanted to, I think Jonathan kind of made some these slides and then I modified them a bit. Jonathan Fletcher is essentially leading the functional screen group uh, within our LifeRaft research group. And um, it, it, just basically, oncogenes are normal genes, or genes that are normally found in your bodies. Um, but they're activated by different kinds of processes generally involving mutations. And um, what happens when they're activated is they drive cancer. 
So the cancer cells are taking advantage of normal processes and just essentially singling out these processes and using them to drive cancer. And the best example of an oncogene that you all know is KIT. KIT is a canonical, prototypical oncogene. When it is activated, and it, it's the only thing that needs to be activated to generate a GIST. All you need is a, GIST, a KIT mutation in the wrong cell in your body and you will have a GIST. And they're, generally these are drivers of tumor cell co uh, growth. You may have heard that cancer cells are addicted to oncogenes. That's true. Uh, we know that GIST is addicted to KIT because if we inhibit KIT, the GIST will sit there and it won't proliferate. Um, some of the cells will even die. And um, again, what oncogenes do is they cause growth, survival, invasive mes metastasis, all these bad things. And we don't like oncogenes. We like to study them, but we want to inhibit them. That's the goal of this research. Uh, the other side of the coin are tumor suppressor genes, and I mentioned already one tumor suppressor gene, P53, this morning. These act as the brakes on cell growth and survival, so generally these things keep cells from dividing and growing, and in normal cells, tumor suppressors are activated because if the cell starts dividing, growing inappropriately, a tumor cell all of a sudden becomes activated and shuts that cell down. That's the normal process, but what happens in tumor cells is these tumor suppressors are lost. They lose their activity. And so it's like losing the brakes of your car. Literally, you can't stop. You can't stop your vehicle. And that's the same thing that happens with a tumor suppressor. So in short, that's what oncogenes and tumor suppressors do. So Jonathan has two different kinds of screens. I like this little diagram because it kind of, cause it reminds me of the conceptual idea of what happens with these uh, functional knockdowns. And so these go by the names like siRNA screens, shRNA screens. But literally what we're doing now is turning off, so there's 11,000 genes in a, a typical cell. And what shRNA and siRNA allow us to do is to turn those genes off one at a time. Literally turning them off um, using molecular switches known as these uh, siRNAs and shRNAs and observe what happens to the cell. And so um, it's a complex process, but by turning these things off one at a time and interrogating the cell, when the cell does something, every once in a while the cell raises their hand and says, you know, hey, I don't like the fact that you just turned off that gene. We notice that, we document it, and then we go back and study it further. And that's what a screen is. It's going to identify a bunch of different hits. And then that validation process, which I mentioned, so important, um, allows us to then study them in detail. So that's essentially what siRNAs do. And just to give you one example of one of the, the big hits in the siRNA screen, in fact, it was the number one hit, is a thing called CDC37. Well, here's KIT. You guys know KIT. Here's another protein that you probably heard about, HSP90. And HSP90 is um, a protein, essentially, that folds KIT up correctly and makes it active. And so this is a target here. We know this is a target. And we found CD, or Jonathan found CD37, CDC37 in his screen. And he has this little cartoon here to kind of show you what CDC37 does. So CDC37 binds to KIT, and it takes it over to SHP90 for its folding. Um, and so CDC37 is a nice target. We didn't know about it before these screens, but it makes sense that it would be a good target. The problem is CDC37 is not a kinase. In fact, it doesn't have any activity that would be easy to target. So Jonathan and his group, as well as some smart people in different pharmaceutical companies, are trying to figure out how to, to inhibit this. Of course, ASHP90 uh, is a major target, but that's been really, really difficult to develop a, a good therapy for. That's why the therapeutic trials haven't really worked. We know that if we can take down HSP90 in a GIST cell, that's going to have a very deleterious or bad effect on that tumor cell. It's just a hard thing to do. Um, so we'll get there. Uh, here's Annette Duensing, University of Pittsburgh. And uh, just to show you an example, so Annette's also been doing some siRNA screens in her laboratory. This is some actual data from her laboratory. And so just showing an example of one of her hits. So she's studying something which she calls kinase X. She didn't want to fully reveal it um, yet because it's, kind of, it's almost um, going to be too preliminary to talk about in its entirety, but just to serve it as an example. And so these bands, when you see these bands on a protein gel, we use antibodies to detect them. So that means that this protein is present in this cell. And this is the normal form of that protein, and this is the activated form of that protein. And when we knock it down, here we are taking away over time that protein. So you can see that the normal proteins disappeared, as well as the phosphorylated protein. And now that protein is missing from that cell. And Annette asked, what happens to proliferation in those cells? 
So she uses a, D, a technique known as BRDU labeling. I won't go into the detail, but it basically shows which cells are proliferating or dividing. And she quantitated that. And you can see the normal cells over time grow. They increase in number, 24 hours, 48, 72, and 96. There's just more cells, essentially, that are dividing. Whereas when she knocks down this kinase, which is called kinase X, in fact, things don't grow as well. And so that's a validation of this hit, and it's interesting to us because it's a kinase, and it could result in a potential new therapy. We'd like to translate that eventually into a therapy if it stands up to more rigorous um, experiments, and those will be performed um, over the next several months, and we'll figure out whether this really is a great target that might be of use in the treatment of GIST. Um, the other side of the coin, when, so uh, Jonathan does one technique where he takes away each gene. Now, uh, this technique, which is known as ORF screening for open reading frame, he's going to add things back one at a time. So he's literally putting in genes and adding them back. And this identifies those tumor suppressors that have been lost. And again, he's going to ask what happens. So he flips the switch. Instead of flipping the switches off, he's flipping them back on. And it's exactly the same idea as taking them away. And again, he's waiting for a cell to declare that there's a problem because a protein just entered into that cell that's doing something negative in terms of the tumor. We like the stuff that impacts the tumors negatively. And so we look for those, and then we will study those. And it is possible to, uh, to turn things back on therapeutically. It's much more difficult, though, to turn something on than it is to turn it off. And so generally, the things that are identified here themselves may not be targetable, but the processes that they represent may be targetable in a different way than just uh, um, you know, re-expressing a protein, which is very difficult to do. This guy, who I haven't mentioned before, didn't make the live-in meeting. His name's Thomas Ordog. He's at Mayo Clinic. And what Thomas adds to our group is he is an expert on something called the interstitial cells of Gahal. You may have heard about the ICC. They're a cell that, that is in your gut. They reside along the entire length of the gastrointestinal tract. And we know now, after years and years of research, that, in fact, GISs arise from the interstitial cells of Cajal. That's the normal cell type that's gone bad, that's made a GIST. And this guy knows everything there is to know about interstitial cells of Cajal. He's a major leader in that field. And what he brings to our group was a couple things. So the first thing he brought to our group was the ability to isolate and purify interstitial cells of Cajal. And this is actually a gene expression profiling experiment where he looked at interstitial cells of Cajal versus other cell types. And the fact that these are all red means that they're all the cell, same cell type. So what he's done is he's successfully purified the interstitial cells of Gahal, and we can now study them to look at what the gene, uh, the normal transcriptional profile, the normal sorts of things that we find in interstitial cells of Gahal, and that helps us to understand how GISTs form and how, how we can essentially then um, treat them. Uh, the other thing that he brings that I think is really critical is he's been able to identify interstitial cell of Gahal stem cells. And the reason that we're interested in those stem cells is we think, in short, that these stem cells go on to populate tumors. So every time somebody has a GIST, we, uh, many of us, it's, it's certainly but far from proven, believe that there's a component within that tumor that is stem cell-like. In fact, it's interstitial cell of Cajal stem cell-like. And we want to know everything we can learn about those stem cells because, quite frankly, I think that they're probably a major source and contribute to gene resistance or, or therapeutic resistance. And so we want to understand them and be able to treat the stem cell of the compartment of the tumor as well as the major compartment. I think we're doing a good job with Gleevec and Sutin and Regorafenib, et cetera, in treating the major component of the tumor, but we're not getting to that stem cell, that resistant component as well. And I think that there'll be some nice translational things that will be found by studying these stem cells. And I'll just point out, not to go into detail, this has actually been published, but the first thing that you'll notice, this is actually the um, protein phenotype that we've studied in these stem cells. And the first thing you'll notice is kit, and then that word low next to it, right up here. And low is bad, right, because we're treating kit. That's what all these inhibitors do. They treat kit. But in fact, stem cells, interstitial cells of Cajal stem cells don't express a lot of kit. And so they're going to be innately resistant to any therapies that are used, uh, that take advantage of kit uh, to treat GIST. Um, also, just to talk a little bit now about drug screening. So um, just to show you a couple of other things that, that are used now to do very large drug screening. This is a, a robot that passes samples along. This is a library array, and this robot will go along and collect samples and so forth. Very high tech. 
Um, that's me with my frog. Um, my wife took that picture, right? Uh, it seems kind of odd, but um, uh, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to kind of get the frog so you could <laughs> see it. Um, and and um, we, do, we do actually use those frogs for inspiration. I keep mine near my desk, and um, when I'm having a tough day, I often look at the frog and think about your own. Um, Okay, so this is actually the results of about a 100 panel uh, drug screen, just to kind of give you an idea. So we actually looked at 100 different drugs. Here they are, they all have kind of funny looking names because they're not really um, used in the clinic yet, although some of them are. And in fact, there's some kid inhibitors buried in here. Here's serafinib, here's the satinib, for instance. Gleevec is here, oh, here's imatinib, uh, here's um, Sutent. And we did, used three different cell lines in the screen, and these red boxes simply indicate that we were able to inhibit that cell line with the drug. And so we knew about a lot of the drugs here, but you'll also see some hits out here and some other hits out here. And so um, we, using these screens, we identified drugs that basically just look interesting. Not all of them pan out. And in, in fact, if we got one new drug out of a 100, dr uh, 100 drug screen, we'd be really, really excited. That would be a fantastic result. And just to give you a flavor, of the kind of things that we found. So I really like SICK, uh, spleen tyrosine kinase, as a target for a kit. It's one of the, or for, for GIST, it's one of the things that we identified in that last screen I just showed you um, that had a pretty dramatic effect on the GIST cells. And so um, here they are. This is a bunch of different cell lines that are um, uh, express kit and are essentially all GIST cell lines but one. And this is 100% proliferation activity here with no drug, and as these lines go down, that's a good thing because it means the drugs are no, or the cells are no longer proliferating after we give them increasing amounts of drug. And this is a standard dose-response curve that we use every day in our laboratory, and that means that it's affecting the growth of these cells. And now, this kind of fancy picture has a bunch of protein spots all over it. And here you can see one that you know. This is phosphokit. That's the activated form of kit. Here's the normal, um, just total kit that's not activated. Some other players, I want you to take a look at this phospho S6 um, line here. Here's S6, and um, uh, just to kind of describe why, why I'm excited about 6. So here's Gleevec, this is imatinib here. We, we use IM as sort of an abbreviation. And you can see that imatinib inhibits the phosphorylated form of kit. And, and um, whereas uh, a time course with this um, a sick inhibitor known as R406, does it really do anything to the phosphorylated form of KIT? Um, however, if you look at phospho S6, which is a downstream player um, that's downstream of KIT and has a lot to do with protein translation, it's very, very important. It's a good indicator that we're doing something to perturb the cells. You can see, in fact, that when you treat just cells with imatinib, that phospho S6, here it is. Bright means more of that protein is activated. A little faint little line or no line means that very little of the protein has been activated. You can see that it has essentially the same effect on S6 that imatinib does, but it doesn't do it through KIT. It's doing it through another mechanism, and that mechanism we think is through inhib inhibition of spleen tyrosine kinase or SICK. And so that gives another angle, another ability to treat GIST patients that's totally I not related to KIT. And in fact, you might ask, well, what if you put those two drugs together? And we're sort of doing that study now to ask, what happens when you add a matinib to sick? Does that kill cells? Is it more effective somehow? But at least uh, a drug like this could be used in, the, uh, in, in uh, a scenario where we no longer have drugs to, to treat the kind of kit mutations or in the kit mutants that are refractory to drugs like Gleevec. So we think six is going to be really interesting. We're working with a drug company now that makes a, a form that's used clinically to treat rheumatoid arthritis to potentially investigate this drug now in actual patients, and that would be uh, the next goal of this research. Uh, another guy that's been helping with drug screens uh, is Sebastian Bauer. I always sort of say that Sebastian's our sort of artsy guy in the group. His pictures always have like art and things. And, I wouldn't be surprised, in fact, if he'd painted that himself. He's very talented. He plays a number of instruments, and he's very worldly. He's always reading interesting books. Um, but he is a serious, serious research. Here's his frog. Here's his, here's your rune frog. And he's an S in Germany. And um, he's been interested lately in something called discovered in, uh, uh, on GIST-1, or DOG-1, which is a marker for GIST. It's expressed, in fact, in interstitial cells of Cajal. That's why it's expressed in GIST. And Matt Vanderein, the guy from Stanford, uh, did a study many years ago, and he found, in fact, that DOG1 was highly expressed in GISTs of all types, sort of irregardless of their mutational status. And 
um, Sebastian now has gotten interested in the function of dog one and really asked the question, what happens if you inhibit or knock out dog one? So he took dog one away from GIST cells, and it kind of impacted them a little bit. They didn't proliferate quite as well as cells that um, uh, didn't or that had dog one. But interestingly, this is, um, these are two mice here. These are called nude mice. They look nude because they don't have any fur. And that's because they have, they're genetically compromised. Their, uh, their, their immune genes have been lost, and that affects their hair growth. And here's a, a, a tumor that contains dog one, and you can see it's kind of big. Uh, it's growing very well, whereas the, the tumor that's lost to dog one grows much less well. And quite frankly, we don't understand this yet, but it's uh, a, an interesting finding, and, and that's the kind of study that we're, um, those of us in the group are, are doing pretty routinely. So he's looking at dog one. Here's Matt Vanderine. He's sort of the, the, the most uh, beautiful member of our group. We always tease Matt because he kind of always comes in like a really shabby T-shirt and torn up jeans. He's... Um, <laughs> But he's a really good researcher. Here's his urine frog, which lives on his microscope. He's Matt's a pathologist, and he's at Stanford. Um, and, and Matt actually has an interest in uh, something that's sort of related to GIST, which is leiomyosarcomas. Certainly leiomyosarcomas aren't GIST, but Matt studies both leiomyosarcomas <coughs> and GIST. And this was kind of an exciting finding that he published recently about CD47. CD47 is a gene which is, is expressed by macrophages. And we never really thought macrophages were doing much as to cancer. But in fact, the immune system interacts with the cancer all the time and plays a very important role. And just to show you what happens, these are lungs. These are actually mouse lungs um, that have been injected with tumor cells. And when Matt co-injects CD47, he doesn't get any tumor growth. All these little brown nodules here are what happens with just with the tumor without an anti-CD47 antibody. And so, in fact, he can completely suppress uh, metastasis in leiomyosarcoma with uh, an anti-CD47 antibody. And now he's done that in GIST. The results are a bit more variable, but some of the lines did respond, and he was able to inhibit metastasis in GIST as well in some lines. And he's really trying to figure out now why some of the cell lines didn't respond, why others did, but with the idea of possibly bringing forward an anti-CD47 uh, antibody therapy that could be used by GIST patients. He's also interested in something called ROR2. ROR2 is, of course, interesting to us because it's a kinase. Kinases are druggable. That's a good thing. And essentially, he's looked at ROR2 in GIST and in leiomyosarcomas, and it seems to be playing a role in proliferation as well. Um, we'll talk very briefly about a study now that's been done by um, Maria Debiak Richter. And so, uh, just, and this is kind of um, getting towards the the end here, and it looks like we're going to be on time. Maybe there'll be time for a couple of questions. But this is a cell. This is a schematic diagram of a cell. And I do think it's useful for those of you who don't deal with proteins and know all these proteins and uh, everything about cells, to think about the cell as a, a sort of a group of circuits. And it kind of looks to me like my dad was an electrical engineer, and when I was a kid, he used to sort of show me his diagrams and stuff and try to explain the sort of things he was working on. And um, and it looked a lot like this, <laughs> I kind of remember. And so here's Kit up here. Kit lives at the cell surface. This is the membrane, and there's some other proteins up here. This is sort of a generic diagram, but certainly Kit is here. And here's all the drugs that can be used to treat Kit. And Kit talks to a variety of pathways. This is the major pathway that it talks to, which is called the PI3 kinase pathway. I mentioned earlier that Mike Heinrich found a mutation in PI3K uh, that uh, activated uh, some uh, rare, rare GIST. But here's AKT1. Um, I think phospho S6 is down here somewhere. I don't see it on this diagram, but it's phospho S6, which you talked about previously, is on here as well. Here's the RASMAP kinase pathway. That's another important pathway. Um, and we do think the RASMAP kinase pathway also plays a role in GIST, especially in those that are refractory resistant to therapy. Um, and so the goal, or the, what we've been doing for the last 10 years, is inhibiting this protein up here, right, at the top of the pathway. That's why it's so effective. It's activated, and it's the first thing. And so. If you can control this, you can really control everything downstream in the cell. That's why inhibiting KIT is so successful. But as you all know, with prolonged therapy with imatinib, a lot of patients become resistant to KIT inhibition, and they require something else. And so you, you might ask yourself is, what happens now if we inhibit both KIT and PI3K, the downstream player here, simultaneously? And so Maria actually looked at that in vitro. and um, 
here's the result. And I'm just going to focus on this part of the curve because this is the most interesting part of the curve. So in the group of mice that were treated with imatinib alone, Gleevec, the, they stopped the therapies here and asked what happens. Do the tumors regrow? You can see that the tumors, all the tumors are impacted very well with these different drug combinations. Basically, the size goes way down. But then Maria withdrew the drugs and said, what happens now with these tumors? Do they regrow? That's an important sort of um, bar, if you will, for cure, Are you curing these patients, these mice in this case. And you can see that the imatinib-treated just, just grew back really fast. But when she combined uh, Gleevec with a PI3K inhibitor, they're not clinically available yet, but they're coming. You'll see those over the next couple of years. Look at the, the rate of, of growth. It did come back eventually, but it was much more impacted by that combination therapy. And that's exactly what you would predict by knowing about the, 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 the tumor diagram, which I just showed you, or the signal transduction diagram. And, um, in, in fact, there will be clinical trials now using imatinib plus a PI3K inhibitor. So certainly keep your eye to that. I know Jim Hughes, of course, will have that on the website as soon as it's available, but you can always call and contact Jim. Jerry's quite knowledgeable as well about what's going on with these different trials. And we want to get the right patients on the right trials. That's another power of this group is that since we all know each other, we all come together. Um, that you can use your resources in the life raft group to find, ex find out which trials really are the appropriate trials for you to get on. And, and I know Jerry and Jim spend an enormous amount of time thinking about these problems, like who is the right patient for this trial. They even think about the drugs up ahead. It's, it, it's very impressive to me that they sort of evaluate the trials at a very theoretical level and say, you know, I think that's going to be a good trial or that's not a good trial, and they'll direct you, help you to get to the right trials. And again, you can always contact people in the, the research group as well who are happy to provide uh, advice. So that's all I had to talk about this morning, just to give you this overview. Um, I hope it's helpful and informative. I, didn't, I hope I didn't blow you away with sort of all this technology and techniques and gobbledygook sort of speak. I, uh, um, um, but if you took anything away from, from this research uh, talk, that's great.